The World Columbian Exposition, which was shortened the name for the World's Fair Columbian Exposition, took place in Chicago. The 1893 World Fair was considered an amazing achievement, and not just because it took place only 22 years after Chicago was consumed by fire. 1871, an inferno took over and destroyed most of the wooden city. There was an estimate of over 321 people killed in this fire, and damages costing over $200 million, just over $4 billion today. After this extremely humbling incident, city officials decided to rebuild this densely populated city using highly skilled architects and more fireproof buildings. Although it took yet another fire in 1874, just three years after the first one, to make matters more seriously. In 1890, Chicago beat its rivals New York, Washington DC, and St. Louis to host the 1893 World's Fair. This was because the city raised more money than its rivals from wealthy investors, including the Marshall Fields, a local business that grew very popular around that time, cities and states all around the country, and regular day-to-day -day citizens. The first priority for the preparations was the designing and the landscaping and buildings for the Expo. The World Columbian Exposition was largely designed by nationally famous landscape artist John Wellborn Root and his business partners Daniel Burham, Frederick Law Olmsted, and Charles B. Otwood, however, sadly died before their plans came into action. The designers were hugely interested in the expo to be based around artificial lagoons, ponds, and topped off with artificial islands. The main eye-catching attraction was the basin, a huge pond in the middle of the expo, which featured the 65-foot gold statue of the Republic, with a woman holding a globe and a giant staff. For the American exhibit, Daniel Burham was made head designer. Ironically, for an exhibit that was supposed to show off American achievements, the designers went with a classy European style of architecture. In this American exhibit, almost every single building was painted white, gaining its nickname, the White City. Of course, these buildings were only designed to be temporary. Even after the fair was dismantled, the White City's legacy lived on. Architects from all around the world had gained interest in this neoclassical style of building. Not only did it inspire architects, but it may have inspired equally imaginative places as well. According to the Chicago Tribune, the legacy and achievements of the White City potentially inspired the Wizard of Oz writer L. Frank Baum to create the book's Emerald City. The 1889 World Fair, hosted in Paris, had shown off the benefits of electricity and displayed it. But the Chicago World Fair took the groundbreaking technology displayed to a whole nother level. Most Americans had never encountered or even heard of the seemingly magical technology, and they got nothing short of a traumatic introduction to it. At the fair's opening on May 1st, President Grover Cleveland pressed a button, and the entire fair lit up like a Christmas tree. Grover Cleveland star stated, I've never been more excited by anything than what these men presented to me on this day. It excites me for the future of this God-blessed nation and this beautiful world. This was the first World Fair to be lit solely by electricity. There was an exhibit where guests could see all the wonders of electricity, including laundry machines, an early fax machine, electric sewing machines, and even an electric chair. Found at the back of this exhibit, you could find the very first electric walkway, the predecessor to the ones used in airports today. All of this electricity was provided by one famous electricity fan none other than Nikola Tesla. Tesla sold his electric patents for an electrical system based on AC currents. Tesla then used his system to win the bid between rival Thomas Edison to supply electricity to the fair. But Edison still had the fair. He put his latest invention on display, the light bulb. Many guests who looked at this wonder had never seen this work of science. Although world fairs were supposed to unite people from different countries, it was also an opportunity to show that your city or country was capable of wheel. One of these cases was the world's first ever Ferris wheel by George Washington Gill Ferris Jr. Ferris opposed the idea of a giant spinning wheel that people would be able to ride. This was no typical carnival Ferris wheel, to be sure. This Ferris wheel stood over 250 feet tall and could carry 2,160 riders at one time. Burnham was skeptical at the time, and Ferris spent his own money running safety tests. Eventually, Burnham agreed to bring the Ferris wheel to the World's Fair. With all this wonder, excitement, and awe, however, came one of the most notorious serial killers of the time. H. H. Holmes came to Chicago around 1885 and began working at a pharmacy in Englewood, and eventually took it over. 
Holmes had a hotel built near the 1893 World's Fair. Guests could come to this place to stay the night, since it was right next to the World's Fair Expo. This place later became dubbed as the Murder Castle. This humongous hotel contained stairs that would lead nowhere. Doors had brick walls directly behind them, and stairs that you could fall straight through if you didn't watch your step. There were vents strategically placed in spots where people would step, i.e. beds and couches, and even where people wouldn't sleep at all, such as the shower. Hundreds of people went missing from this hotel. Rumors started unfolding that Holmes would release gas out of the vents, a gas that would simply put the guests to sleep. Hotel staff would take the guests down to the basement and then torture the guests and killing them. Though he confessed over 27 murders, he was sentenced to death for only one of them. African American leaders had hoped to use the 1893 World's Fair to show what black people had achieved in just three decades after the Emancipation Proclamation started at the end of slavery. But while all 44 states at the time were represented, along with many other countries refused to let African Americans exhibit themselves as a group. Black people were rejected entry to the fair opening the ceremony. African American leaders had made a way for these voices to be heard, literally. Frederick Douglass was allowed to make the opening ceremony speech, and he used it as a way to condemn America racism. Douglass and Ida B. Wells handed out pamphlets that people signed. These pamphlets enabled the two to appear in the court and officially make August 25th a day for celebrating African American achievements. Although African American people were not able to represent themselves, black and indigenous people from other countries had their own exhibits. But in some ways, this may have been worse than having no representation. These groups were housed in the entertainment strip. As the official fair guide states, visitors could come watch them cook, make tr trinkets, perform their songs and dances, and go out the ordinary life of their tribes. The Native Americans were treated more like animals in a zoo. They were only fed twice a day, and they would have to cook themselves. The World's Columbian Exposition of 1893 helped to pave the way for future communication advancements that we see today.